Well, good morning, everybody. Yesterday on Tuesday, what we watched in the atmosphere was the beginning of this pattern we're going to sit in for most of the next probably about seven days. And what I'm talking about here is we started to see ridging building toward the western United States that's going to deliver some warmth. We're actually going to watch two separate systems. The first one, which went through parts of Colorado, delivering snow to the Rocky Mountains, and they came out into the plains right in through here and dumped some great rains into this area. Then what we saw on the southern side of this was some pretty large thunderstorm activity. I'm talking about this part of Texas. We also had some big storms over in Florida I want to show you. But what's going on here is that this pattern is relatively highly amplified. And this deeper low, watch this one spinning up here between Ontario and Quebec. This is a part of an omega block that is over in the uh, Atlantic Ocean. And that's why it's been difficult to kind of shed and get rid of all this colder air uh, that's in place here. So we're going to watch these next two systems kind of come down and run up the East Coast. And while that happens, this larger ridge builds into the West and we get a deeper trough that will eventually form and curl up over the Great Lakes. April 30th, May 1st, and May 2nd, and that's going to deliver another shot at colder air through the western Corn Belt. But I was just looking at some satellite data here, and I was amazed at the size. This is the sheer size of some of these storms last night. Take a look. So this is uh, what we were watching right here in the Texas Panhandle, and some of these storm systems produced some very large hail. We can see these are called overshooting tops. That's where the momentum of the updraft breaks through the statically stable stratosphere. I mean, that's what we call it, the stratosphere. It's stratified and stable. It warms there, so it's difficult to get air to be buoyant in that area. And uh, you can just see the momentum just carried through. And so that indicates very healthy, very strong updrafts. And they produced a lot of hail. We were looking at the storm reports early this morning. Let me show you back those unfiltered reports. Most of what was going on through here were um, uh, was was very large hail. And that's what we're, we're representing here with these, uh, with these black dots. Um, or excuse me, black triangles. So I was zipping through some of the hail reports. And just some of these numbers are incredible, uh, you know, right here in parts of Texas, three and a half inches. This is larger than baseball size hail. I did run a report on the southern storm just to kind of look at it. So here's the northern storm. This was the southern. They again had that trajectory northwest to southeast. And uh, you can match up your hail size over here, but it's just incredible to see that many of these were uh, producing, um, you know, hail that was uh, bigger than a baseball. Just incredible. Okay, Florida got it on the action as well. And I'm just starting this off where the sun is rising this morning in Florida. But take a look at something I want you to see. Uh, if I take you back to, you know, early in the day, we're going to watch the uh, sea breeze come in. So can you see it right here on both sides? And that's what's going to pop these storms. And some of them did produce hail, but I want you to, to more notice the wind shear. So you can see the tops of them getting blown off quickly out into the Atlantic. And it's just a reminder that as we start to work our way toward... Um, you know, the time of year where the tropics become incredibly important for convection and for the development of tropical systems. Wind shear is going to be key this year, given what's going on with um, El Nino. All right. So uh, let's get back into it here near term. This is today's convective outlook. We're watching this very interesting sagging frontal boundary right into here in the dew point temperatures that the Storm Prediction Center is concerned about severe storms. So they've put an enhanced risk out, risk out excuse me, and we're watching Florida as, as well today. All right, the bigger story here for, for me in terms of ag is that this corridor just got rain. And some places it got quite heavy rain. We saw a few places in Kansas and Oklahoma that picked up well over two inches of total precipitation out of this. And this is, remember, just round one. So I want to show you, we've been kind of keeping up on Garden City sporadically throughout the last few months. I just want to show you the latest data from Garden City. So remember, up until yesterday, the last time they've seen this much precipitation was back in the end of July, beginning of August, and they flatlined since then. We had one event on February 27th that brought in a little bit better than a half inch, and then we had three quarters of an inch measured through pretty early this morning. So we're going to see more precipitation in that area. So here's the reason why. This low is still sitting and spinning right over parts of southeastern Colorado in the intersection between Kansas, Oklahoma, and Texas. So it's still there. And then this is the next wave we're going to watch come over this developing ridge and come right down and hit the same area again. But we will have to watch another deep trough to come through the Great Lakes. We better go through and kind of get all of these sorted out here. So let's pick this up a couple hours from when I'm recording here at 8 a.m. We're still seeing moisture in this area. We're still watching some of those storms moving across the Red River and there's snow in southeastern Colorado. So as we play this forward, we're going to watch that system spin up throughout the day today. This is all the way to 9 o'clock tonight, still getting chances for showers and storms in here. 
And then this evening, remember there's this very odd boundary sitting right in through here, and then the front kicks through it right there. So we're gonna watch this area uh, for severe storms tonight. Now that's not to ignore other things that are going on. Scattered showers in New England, also in parts of the Carolinas back toward the Appalachian Mountains. And there's a weak frontal boundary that's gonna kick right through parts of Manitoba, bringing a front that uh, later on today will go over the Red River of the North, bringing in some rain. But as we play this forward, we see that the next system, there it is, okay, by 9 a.m. on Thursday is starting to slide down while the first one moves through the lower Mississippi River Valley. There's rain coming in on Thursday as well to this part of North Carolina. As we just watch one system move out, the next system moves in, and here we are at 9 p.m. on Thursday night, and we're gonna watch that next system go right back to the same position. Snow in southeastern Colorado, parts of New Mexico. First system spreads its rain through the mid-Atlantic, a place that desperately needs more of this precipitation. Hits part of the eastern Corn Belt, and here we can see the frontal boundary kind of linking the Great Lakes all the way down here to Kansas. Pretty amazing to kind of watch this animation. Uh, I do want to mention that tomorrow on the 27th, we're going to watch the Gulf Coast for the risk of severe storms. And then as we get into the day on the 28th, we are, we'll watch again Texas while one storm system leaves. So potential for some stronger storms from the Carolinas down to Florida. All right. Okay. This is the latest one week forecast of total precip. Now we are drier in a broad sector here of, of the plains in Western Corn Belt. And we're also dry throughout much of the West as the heat starts to, or continues to build into this area. But uh, notice those next two systems, which kind of roll right in through the same area, combined with the deeper low coming over the Great Lakes, we've got a large area here that's expected to get better than an inch of precipitation. And why this is really important is I want to show you uh, the year-to-date precipitation ranks by climate district. So we, we've been discussing this drought in detail for a while. But we've made up some of the deficits throughout parts of the Mid-South, down here in the Southeast, and parts of the Carolinas. But we still have a sector here that needs a lot more rain in parts of Maryland, getting into Virginia, and parts of North Carolina. We also need quite a bit more for Florida, despite the health, uh, those healthy thunderstorms we've been watching as of late. So from here, let's go over to our multi-model analysis, GFS on the left, European on the right. We're going to see these same three systems, so one, two, three. Ready? That's the GFS I was drawing on there, or at least hovering over. So through Thursday, there's that first push coming into the mid-Atlantic and the Carolinas out of the Tennessee Valley. We see the second system dropping down here. Okay, that's the next round of rain coming through later on this week, Thursday, Friday. And then by the time we get into the weekend, we see the deeper low wrapping itself up over parts of the Great Lakes. So this is bringing in the cooler showers uh, and some stronger winds at times and the system just rolls around to its south right here and gets pulled right up the east coast again as that low matures and moves from Ontario into Quebec. Now it's after this time period, after the 2nd of May, where the pattern begins its adjustment. There are troughs that are forming off the west coast, aided by the cooler water that is off the west coast. There's actually a lot of reasons why this is going to happen, but the important thing to know is that the models have honed in on this. And what this is going to do is this is going to change up where the temperature has been quite cold, start to push some mild air in here after the 3rd and 4th and 5th of, uh, of May. And it's also going to set us up for an interesting situation with some severe weather. So a couple of things to look at before we get into that discussion. This is the next 10 days looking at the probability of getting at least an inch of total precipitation. What's changed in the map? Because we've talked about this now all week. It's over here the new setup for moisture coming into the west. And this is the probability of getting three inches of snow in the next 10 days. So again, we're gonna watch this part of Minnesota, northern Wisconsin, and the UP. Okay, we can also see some of this in lower Michigan. But the next system, since it follows the first one going right over the Rocky Mountains, we're gonna see this. What's changed? The Sierra Nevada are now showing up. And if we look out there fully at week two, wetter, wetter, and wetter. But I need you to see that at the same time, we are seeing that the plains in through here are beginning to experience in the models uh, a higher probability of seeing more precipitation. And remember, this is our, our drought region. This is the area we've been incredibly concerned about for, for months, years, honestly. So let me show you what's going on. By day 10, if this trough redevelops and this ridge begins to move out of the plains, a couple of things happen here. The dry line, which earlier in the year was way out you know, into the central plains, uh, will back up. 
and therefore the storms will initiate farther to the west. There will not be any trouble kind of pulling moisture in under this ridge to get into this region in spring. What we also notice here is that if we just look at the severe weather index that uh, my colleague Andrew Pritchard made, I'm going to take you out real quick to day 10. Let's just get out here and start looking at this. Keep an eye on this area. The higher the, the value, the, the, the brighter the colors, the, the, the greater the risk is for some of these strong storms to develop. And you notice that the models are developing these storms you know, following this area. Now, I know you're like, wait a minute, are we going to have huge storms in the West? Uh, this is a byproduct of the algorithm. It, it's showing here the, the shear values on some of this and starting to pop up. So I want you to watch uh, east of the Rocky Mountains here. But as we start to get out here, we just notice that these corridors begin to open as we press here into the, you know, after the 8th and 9th of May, where we're going to start to watch for the risk of severe storms. And a colleague of mine named Victor Cassini at Northern Illinois University, brilliant scientist, uh, great, does some great work here. He uses that CFSV2 model we, we often show, and his week three supercell composite is showing that this is an area that's going to start to really begin in the month of May to see the risk of severe storms start to show up. Now, it's not a guarantee. It's just identifying that climatologically and with the current pattern, this is the area that we're going to have to start to watch. Okay, let's flip this discussion over to temperatures because this morning we did have yet again freeze warnings, frost advisories, and frost watches out for the same regions we've been seeing them. Uh, so let's go have a look out here at what the temperatures are doing. So this is the 6 a.m. temperature map. Again, we got a, another hard uh, freeze just north of this line here where those temperatures were down into the upper 20s. And if we look at where these temperatures are going, let's talk high temperatures first, then we'll look at that freeze line. Here's today's highs. Look at that rain cooled air there, but warmer to the north. This is getting into Thursday. By Friday, we're talking 90s, I mean mid to upper 90s here in parts of California to Oregon. And we play through Saturday into Sunday. That's when the low is wrapping itself around the Great Lakes. We can see all that colder air coming in behind it. But I want you to watch the west coast here. Because of the development of that trough on May 1st, Getting into May 2nd, we see the cooler air arriving again. And the warmth starts to move throughout the Rocky Mountains, throughout the Western Mountains, and will start to show back up in the plains again. What's important about this is that you saw several days here, very, very warm conditions. And I'm very concerned about the flooding risk because right now, still sitting in the Sierra Nevada, there's you know 50 to over 100 inches of liquid in that snow. And we've seen what this has done in terms of river flooding. We know our reservoirs are at capacity or overflowing. We've been talking about uh, the Tulare Lake down here that showed up where there's been just there's a lot of controversy around how they've had to blow out some of the levee system to accommodate that extra water. There's a whole lot more coming because of this. So this flood problem is going to continue to get worse. But if we take a look at GDDs over the next seven days, this is what we're expecting. This is a base of 50 and a max of 86. So we're just kind of getting an idea on who's going to be accumulating the heat units. But let's talk real quickly here about where the frost is going to be. So this is this morning. We've got an idea here from the European model. And I'm just going to take you out to each morning. That's Thursday morning. And just to get a snapshot here. The gray shows us where we're expecting frost. This is getting into Friday morning this week. We're going to play out here to Saturday morning. Then into Sunday morning. And this is when the low is taking shape over the Great Lakes. So this is the time period I'm most interested in. This would be Monday morning. And then on the 2nd, that's Tuesday morning right there. So again, northern Iowa, much of the upper Midwest, higher elevation here along the Appalachian Mountains. But then as we get past this out there toward Wednesday morning, this is what we start to see pattern begins to open up and change and that's reflected in the ensemble forecast of temperatures five day sliding window there's the heat west the colder conditions east but by day five through ten this is when the trough redevelops the warmth and that ridge begins to move it displaces the omega block that's kept this so cold and we start to see that warmth spreading again the last holdout for cooler air will be new england okay but we start to see it really coming in here so this is going to melt what's left of this snow in the northern plains hit it pretty hard here in the southern Canadian prairie and this is going to be uh, some wide open windows to really get a lot of planting done I think if we can dodge the storms that are likely to come out of this pattern for the middle of May. Okay that's it I'll talk to you again tomorrow. Thanks.